today on The Bottom Line. Is Bitcoin the next bubble? How tech companies have changed since the dot-com days? And analyst Scott Kessler says tech valuations are justified. Hello, welcome to The Bottom Line, presented by Fidelity Investments. I'm Sarah Silverstein, and I am at the wonderful NASDAQ market site overlooking Times Square. This week's bottom line is Bitcoin. China initiated a ban on initial coin offerings, which caused cryptocurrencies to stumble this week. The actual ban language from China actually makes it seem like it might be illegal for any cryptocurrency exchanges or any transactions of cryptocurrencies. Most people don't think that it will be applied that way and enforced that way, but the language is there that could allow that, and that is something definitely to watch. Also this week, uh, Nobel Prize winner Robert Schiller did an interview with Quartz, and they asked him, what's the best sign of irrational exuberance? What is the most obvious sign of a bubble? And he said, it has to be Bitcoin. And lots of people agree with Schiller. They say there are signs everywhere that Bitcoin is a bubble, like this story about a lingerie tycoon who's selling luxury apartments in Dubai that can be purchased via Bitcoin and is targeted at Bitcoin millionaires. But these apartments have not yet been bought by any Bitcoin millionaires and don't actually have any connection to the Bitcoin community. So you can't exactly point to it and call it a sign of the Bitcoin bubble. Right now, it's just the first real estate development that we know of that accepts Bitcoin for payment, which could actually be seen as a sign of the strength and potential staying power of Bitcoin. When my daughter's preschool started accepting Bitcoin this year, the head of the school said they were doing it because people were asking to pay in Bitcoin. Transactions matter. You literally can't become a real currency unless people will accept you in return for goods and services. And that's the bottom line. I'm here with Scott Kessler, Director of Equity Research at CFRA. Scott leads his team's tech coverage, so I definitely want to talk to you about technology. What do you think about where tech valuations are right now? Right. Well, thanks a lot for having me, Sarah. Um, a lot has been made about tech valuations really over the last... I would argue not just a couple of years, but five years, really since the beginning of this bull market. I think it's fair to say that on a lot of metrics that we look at, tech is probably fairly or reasonably valued. If you look at PE or PE to growth, we're really right in line with the market. People will look at, say, the indicated dividend yield, and understandably, it's a little bit lower than the S&P 500. But overall, we don't see the excess valuations that people are talking about. And in fact, we do see a lot of names as still attractively valued, despite the fact that they've risen pretty substantially. And which stocks do you see that still have a lot of upside, even at this level? Yeah. So. A lot of stocks that, frankly, people I think are interested in, you know. So the Fang names, for example. So we historically, as a business, have been very much focused on growth at a reasonable price. So you wouldn't necessarily think of the Fang stocks in that category, but we, frankly, have been recommending those names uh, for a pretty long while. We have buy opinions on all four of those names, and for a variety of reasons. I personally cover um, Facebook and Alphabet, and I think people would be surprised to know that the valuations are actually, we think, pretty compelling in addition to what we see as growth that is sustainable, very healthy, and frankly, somewhat unique in the marketplace today. And which is your favorite tech stock that, that you think has the most upside? Right, so in terms of my personal coverage, um, this is kind of a curveball that I'm going to throw you. It's Akamai Technologies. It's the only strong buy recommendation that I personally have right now. And that's after changes where strong buy recommendations had done well. And we've basically just taken profits to some extent or become less positive on those names. Akamai is a name that's actually one of the 10 worst performers in the technology sector in the S&P 500 year to date. And people automatically assume, oh, well, if it has been performing poorly, then it will continue to perform poorly. We don't think about it like that. We see a lot of value after the sell-off. It's a great play on mobile, video, OTT, a lot of the mega trends that we think are going to be dominant for years to come. And the sell-off really, really, we think, has created a buying opportunity. And Apple recently hit a new high after the announcement of the iPhone 8 event. 
what does Apple need to do for that to, to keep the momentum up after the event and after the launch of the phone? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be hard, right? And we've had a strong buy opinion on Apple for some time. I remember a little bit more than a year ago, this was a stock that was in the low 90s. And now we're, I think, at over $160 a share. So it's been kind of tough to some extent a year ago thinking about where the price was. But again, we've seen the appreciation in the shares in part because Apple seems to be delivering in terms of how they're gaining market share. The new iPhone that is expected to be introduced, I think really within a week or so, and I think people are very excited about that. Frankly, sometimes we do see a sell on the news kind of impact, and that's something that folks need to be aware of, especially given the fact that the stock is at all time highs right now. However, I think it's pretty clear that a major growth driver beyond just the new iPhone is going to be the services business, which I think contributed more than uh, a fifth of the company's revenue in the recent quarter. And that's something that we think has legs in terms of a growth story for the company for years to come. So it's going to be really interesting to see what the new iPhone consists of. And a lot of news has been made about augmented reality and about wireless charging and things like that. And I think a lot of that is already priced into the stock. It's amazing. You know, if you go back five years, there really was very little in terms of certainty about what Apple would announce at these um, events. Now, I think there's really not a lot of mystery. And so I think that's going to contribute to maybe a sell on the news and maybe an additional buying opportunity. And what about Snap? Snap has been struggling since its IPO, and it seems like Facebook is out to get it. So how, what can it do? How can it survive? Yeah, it's funny, right? Because it doesn't seem like Facebook is directly announcing or even acknowledging that they're out to get Snap, but it's pretty clear that over the past year, we've seen you know announcement after announcement. We've seen innovation after innovation. We've seen feature after feature all directed at Snap from a variety of Facebook's different properties, most obviously Instagram. What's noteworthy is that Snap, when it came public at the beginning of March, I mean, it was close to $30 a share, I think the day after it came public on March 2nd. And now after the stock has gone from, I don't know, it was $11, $12 a share after they reported recent results, now it's around $15 a share. So people that have bought following those results probably feel pretty good but everyone else is probably thinking, what is going to happen next? And so the way we think about Snap, we have a hold opinion on the stock. We initiated coverage, I think, in early March with a sell. Um, our view right now is that there are a lot of things the company is doing right, but they need to do a better job of innovating more quickly, meeting the challenge that Facebook has put out there and really doing a better job of building out its media and advertising business. There's potential, but the company's losing a lot of money and estimates have been coming down. We have a hold opinion on the stock. Okay, and everybody else, and even you mentioned the FANG stocks, but you say those aren't the four to look at. You say it's GAFA. Yeah, it's not, it doesn't roll off the no. tongue necessarily, but we think about it in the context of GAFA, as you mentioned, which is actually, I think, relatively commonly used in Europe and not necessarily in the most positive way. They talk about the notion of um, Google and Amazon and Facebook and Apple being dominant technology platform companies focused on the internet. And so we took a look at those companies and we think that Apple in and Netflix out, which is essentially the difference here, makes a lot of sense. As you referenced, Apple is trading at an all-time high. It's the largest company on the planet. It has a number of different initiatives as well as what we know about in terms of hardware and software and so dominant in mobile and other areas. Netflix is much, much smaller. It really has one offering. It's only really recently becoming more international and it's not as diversified. So we think looking at Apple instead of Netflix makes a lot of sense. And GAFA really consists of not just four of the five largest technology companies in the world, but four of the five largest companies in the world save Microsoft, which we think probably is a lagger when it comes to this particular area. And last question, is there something that you think that everybody else is getting wrong about tech stocks right now? 
Well, I guess there are a couple things, but the most obvious one that comes to mind, especially given that this week is kind of an important one for the video game software companies with new game introductions. I think Destiny, for example, from um, Activision is coming out. The new Madden game from Electronic Arts as well. Um, I think people have been focusing on those names, Activision and Electronic Arts. I think they were the best and ninth best um, technology stock performers in the S&P 500 year to date, but we see excess valuations, we see growth slowing down, we see risk from a cost perspective, and those companies are very reliant on a few titles. So those stocks have done very well, but we actually have a strong sell on Activision and a sell on Electronic Arts, in part because we think all the good news and more are in those names. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. We keep looking at tech valuations now versus where they were during the dot-com days. And this week's Fidelity Insight from Denise Chisholm looks at the difference between the companies now and then. She says, before, there were smaller emerging, highly volatile stocks of the late 1990s and early 2000s. And today, tech leaders are large companies with strong free cash flow and operating margins. In fact, the operating margins of tech stocks today are at a much higher level than they were pre-burst. And operating margins are increasing. Chisholm also points out that if you look at tech stocks relative to the broader market, when operating margins are rising, they outperform by 5.5%. And in times when operating margins are shrinking, tech companies underperform the broader market by 2.5%. And that's today's Fidelity Insight. That's it for this week. Thanks to Scott Kessler for joining us. Thank you to Fidelity Investments for making the show possible. And of course, thank you to NASDAQ for hosting us.